we're really happy to be able to visit with uh, Dr. Spencer Wells here uh, tonight. I'm in Texas. It's nighttime. He's in Singapore, and it's morning time for him. And he's been kind enough to share some time to give us uh, some background on the coronavirus situation, um, both there in, um, in Singapore, as well as his experience as a geneticist with uh, situations like this. And so um, I don't want to waste any time. Um, Dr. Wells, thank you so much. And what can we um, learn from you? Why, why are you interested in the coronavirus and what brings you your, in your background to this place where you can share this with us? Yeah, I mean, I have a PhD in population genetics, but I've always been interested in virology. I took virology and epidemiology classes as an undergraduate. Um, I worked in a virology lab a couple of summers. So I know the field pretty well and I follow the literature. Um, emerging diseases are a particular interest. Um, the Coming Plague, a book by Lori Garrett that came out in 1994, I read it immediately when it was released. And, you know, obviously people have seen movies like Contagion. I mean, it's just really fascinating because it's evolution in action. And so, you know, I've been tracking this since the beginning. And epidemiologists have thought for a long time that there's going to be this disease X that emerges from a wet market in China. Um, and this seems to be it. It is, you know, relatively easy to catch. So it has a high transmission rate or R0. Um, it has a high attack rate. So roughly 60% of the people who are exposed to it will catch it, which is very, very high, much higher than the seasonal flu. And as we've all read, of course, it has a relatively high um, case fatality rate. So the number of people who are dying out of the total number of people infected is around 2 to 3%. Um, that varies a lot across different age groups. So younger people are much less likely to die. People in their 80s have a 15% mortality rate. So, um, you know, it's just, it's a really scary thing and it's exploding. And it's the sort of thing that we should have been prepared for after SARS. Um, which emerged in 2002, 2003, also a coronavirus, also came out of a Chinese wet market. But I think people are kind of arrogant and complacent, and they think it's just not going to happen to them. <laughs> so here we are. And, that, and you have your, your background as a geneticist. How does that inform your understanding of what you're seeing um, evolving in China and now spreading uh, worldwide. Yeah, this is evolution in action. We're witnessing evolution as it's happening. Um, evolution in the sense of, you know, we have this new pathogen that's killing certain people, and it would be interesting to study the genetic characteristics of the people who get really ill versus those who don't really get ill at all. Um, but the virus itself is going to be evolving, too. And so, you know, it's just really interesting from an evolutionary perspective to study things like this. Um, it's not often that you get the opportunity to see something like this happening in real time. And, th and that, I guess, the fact that it is evolving in real time, one of the things that came across the news the other day here in the United States was the fact that um, in Seattle they had traced the uh, genome mutations of the Seattle strain back to China, showing that they think it had been here since mid-January. And for reference here, this is March 3rd that we're... Um, we're speaking here March 4th for you, March 3rd for me. And um, can you give us some insight as to how that testing would go and how, how we're able to tell from the virus in Seattle that it's been in a population here for as long as we think it has been? Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the thinking is that when it's introduced to a population, you're dealing with a single strain, so a particular genetic sequence. This is a virus that has an RNA genome rather than a DNA genome. It actually has a very, very long RNA genome, the longest one that's ever been found. So it's about 30 KB. So there's a lot of opportunity in RNA viruses for mutations to occur. And so if you assume that a single case or single string introduced it into, say, the population of Seattle, and then you look at the accumulated variation and knowing the mutation rate, you can actually trace back to when that first case entered. And the answer seems to be mid-January, which is scary. That, that is, and do we have a sense that, that has similar work been done in China to give us a sense for when this may have made the, uh, the hop into human populations? We're looking at- Yeah, the, the evidence in China is that it probably happened in November rather than early December. So it's been there for a lot longer than people, you know, suspected. Okay, that makes sense. And then um, one of the things is 
um, as you look at, at the spread of this, um, how do you see um, it moving in, the, in Singapore? What have they done? You mentioned to me off camera before, they, you felt they had been very successful in their handling of this. Um, and currently, yeah. I think we're looking in Singapore at just over 100 cases. Um, how yeah, are so as of this morning, um, looking on the dashboard, the Hopkins dashboard, there are 110 confirmed cases in Singapore, 122 in the U.S. So that number in the U.S. is going up significantly. The Singapore rate seems to have kind of flattened out and it's rising slowly and linearly rather than exponentially. You know, Singapore was primed with the SARS virus in 2002, 2003, so they kind of know what to do. They're very good at what's called contact tracing. So when you enter a building here, you have to give your contact information just in case somebody you know, becomes infected who also visited that building and they want to get in touch with you. Um, so they've been just amazing at that. They have an excellent healthcare system. They've quarantined all the cases. They do this contact tracing for every single confirmed case. And you know, quite honestly, people are concerned about it, but life is pretty normal here. You know, you don't really, you don't see a lot of people walking around with masks or anything like that. And I think certainly for my students, that's the uh, feeling we get because most of, I think what we're seeing coming from Asia is of course from China where, you know, masks are, are the norm and we're seeing runs on masks now here in Dallas. If we want to go out and buy masks, you're unlikely to. And the main advantage for masks is, is that it forces you to think about touching your face, which you should not be doing. Wash your hands often, you know, become like Howard Hughes, become a germaphobe, wash your hands constantly. Don't touch your face when you're out in public. Try to avoid touching surfaces. Things like when you get on an escalator, try to avoid touching that little handrail. Um, you know, just be careful and, and use your brain. Like it's, it's pretty simple. And there's a chance that you're going to get infected. And in most cases, certainly if you're young, it's not going to be fatal. So, you know, I, I don't feel like people should be changing their lives so drastically. Um, you know, they just have to be smart about how they behave in public. Right. And that's one of the things that we've uh, been working with here. I had a funny thing while students were watching um, a news clip uh, earlier today, and I watched them and see how many of them had hands to face in some way, shape, or form. And it was routinely, over a span of five minutes, almost everyone in the class was having that sort of contact. And people just aren't aware of that, which is, it's really neat for us to be, this brings that awareness to us in ways yeah. that we would never really think about it. And it's the benefit, of course, helps us with seasonal flu. Which, yeah, absolutely. Which is a much bigger potential problem. Um, it's not killing as many people, um, you know, in terms of case fatality rate, but, you know, the rate of infection is so high that still a lot of people die of seasonal flu every single winter. Um, you know, it's, it's an issue. And so this is, you know, behavior that we should all be practicing all the time. Um, you know, the concern with the coronavirus is that it's new. We don't know where it's going to go in terms of its evolution. Will it become deadlier over time? Who knows? Um, you know, it's the unknowns that are so scary about something like this. Yep, and I think that's exactly what we're, we're looking at. And certainly there's a lot of concern here in the States as the numbers are, are starting to pop up from being very low for a while and everything else had, had a uh, connection, you know, initially to China. Um, and now we have community spreading. And I think that's making people much, much more nervous than yeah. before. And that's something yeah. that education I mean, like this becomes important for us to have a better understanding so that people don't freak out about things unnecessarily. Yeah, I mean, listen, I think that there are some things that probably need to change. Um, I would not attend a big conference right now. I'm, I'm waiting for them to cancel South by Southwest in Austin, for instance, which is supposed to be happening in about two weeks. But, you know, it's, that's really dangerous. You have 100,000 people from around the world, descending on this one place, packed into a tiny enclosed space. The Austin Convention Center is not that big. Mm -hmm. You know, that's asking for trouble in my opinion. Right, and that said, I know we, we've seen uh, some other um, conference, scientific conferences have been canceled already and that. Has, has the Physical Anthropology Conference been canceled yet? I, I, have, I have not heard that it is. I'm waiting for it to be. So yeah. That is, um, I would be surprised if it were to, uh, 
go ahead, especially being in Los Angeles, a, a part of the country that has its own set of cases already. Um, yeah. No, when we flew through LAX last week, uh, it, it really felt like you were taking your life into your own hands. You know, just everybody's touching everything and TSA is like going through your bag and it's just like, whoa. Um, yeah, I hope that we're going to be okay. And so knock wood, we didn't catch anything, but yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's good. Hopefully when you come back from, from your time in Singapore, you won't have to uh, spend any extra time uh, coming back into the States. Hopefully that will be... Uh... Yeah, I mean, listen, we are prepared to ride this out in Singapore. Um, we're going to be in Indonesia starting on Sunday. I'm leading a private jet expedition. We're going to be visiting all these amazing human evolution sites. So the cave Lingbua, where they discovered the Hobbit. We're going to visit the new cave art in Sulawesi, the 44,000-year-old stuff that was announced in December. Um, we're going to visit the orangutans at Camp Leaky in Borneo. So that's going to be fun. Um, but yeah, when we get back here in, you know, at the end of March, we're going to make the call then. We'll see how things are looking in the States. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Well, we, we hope to get you back into Texas as soon as we can. Um, Absolutely. Because, yeah, and hopefully we'll be um, clear of things by then. You know, I think it, that, that's another thing we're looking at. What is the seasonality of this particular strain? Um, and I, that's something obviously we don't have a sense for yet and probably won't until, uh, you know, will this peter out like SARS did? Or will we be looking at something, what, will this be an H1N1 where it becomes kind of the low-level pandemic that we eventually can develop a vaccine for. I don't know if you have any thoughts on, on that. My gut feeling right now is that this is going to stick around. It's going to become endemic, and it may become seasonal, like seasonal influenza. It's just, it's so infectious. It's not as infectious as something like measles, which is just crazy. Off that has charts. not about 20. Um, but it has an R of four to five, which is pretty high. You know, it's higher than seasonal flu. So I just have a feeling it's probably going to stick around. That makes sense. And then yeah. that's, um, you know, I think people are starting to get that, the sense that we need to be ready here in the States for the long term. Yeah. And that's, you know, I've been talking with my students about um, social distancing and what that means, because that's very much a new idea here in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. It is. You know, I, are you guys talking about canceling school at St. Mark's? We, we are not having that official conversation yet. However, we, that, that's going to be kind of a health department um, decision mm -hmm. at, at City of Dallas. Of course, if um, students at, our, you know, at St. Mark's were to come down with the virus, obviously that would be an immediate um, shutdown for cleaning and the like. Um, yeah. But people are playing it fairly low key right now. Um, mm -hmm. My feeling is once we get um, testing done on a wider range, we'll see cases in, in the North Texas area for no other reason that we have DFW Airport, a major international hub. And yep. certainly people have come through who have had contact probably with strains both from, the, from China as well as from you know, Italy, Iran, and the like. So, mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. would not be surprised to see us have a smattering of cases in the next. Yeah, Iran is really scary. What's going on over there? I mean, I see these videos on social media and it's just shocking. Right, and that's one of the things we're trying to get a sense for in class is why is it that the, at least the initial death rate was so much higher there than elsewhere? And it wasn't clear to me, and this is just a lack of information, I think, was it impacting more elderly populations or is there something about COVID-19 in Iran that's, having an impact on otherwise healthy people. Yeah, Not lots safe. of questions. I mean, I suspect that the number of infected people is much, much higher than is being reported. You know, someone estimated, there was a scientific paper published a week ago, I think, where at the time Iran was reporting something like 500 cases and they estimated the true number was 18,000. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And so that, that would account for the death rate being what it is. And yeah. Okay. That makes good sense. So um, that makes sense. Um, any thoughts you have on, um, on the virus moving forward? And um, yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's a big RNA genome. There are a lot of potential places for mutations to occur in there. 
And so, you know, it's going to change over time. The question is, does it become deadlier or does it become more benign? Um, hopefully the latter, but we'll see. Mm -hmm. That makes good sense. And for you, when you come back to the States, what do we have to look forward to, to from you um, in the near future? Any, oh, gosh. Any projects um, that um, we should keep our eyes peeled for? Yeah, we're going to be making an announcement this spring about my for-profit consumer genomics company going nonprofit um, and being focused really kind of a think tank focused on personal genomics, um, both from an educational perspective and also a policy perspective. Um, how do you maintain privacy in this era of you know mass genetic testing where like 40 million people have now tested their DNA? Um, and companies want to access that and make money off of it and use it to catch criminals. And what are your, you know, genomic privacy rights? You know, how do you define those? So, yeah, a lot to do, working on a couple of books. Um, yeah, and then this new travel company is, is really fun. So we have a lot of trips planned. So that sounds like you're, you're set for a, a very busy uh, time down the road. And we really appreciate yeah. the fact that you're willing to... Uh, take some time out of your busy day there before your, your big trip to uh, share with us. And that, that means a lot to us. Absolutely. We, we hopefully, uh, once you get back, uh, we can get you into to our, see our new uh, science building here in Dallas. And uh, Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, yeah. We'd love next time you're up in Dallas. Let's plan on cool. getting together. Okay. Sounds good, John. Thanks a ton. We appreciate it. Take care. All right. Thanks.